Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. I think you will find this to be a very interesting night, and I hope uh, you'll just keep chatting about it and passing on what you hear here uh, for the people who seem not to know how to plan their evenings well and who didn't join us tonight, but we're so proud to have the people who did plan their evenings well. I'm Patty Limerick from the Center of the American West. Uh, I want to tell everyone what you may already know, that Ken Burns is going to be here on October 2nd at 7 p.m. in Mackey, and tickets are on sale, and you can get them on the Mackey website. And um, it will be, I think, a really interesting evening. Obviously, the man has made more films than we could possibly talk about, but that's why we'll talk mostly about his soul. I think that's what we'll do, is we'll, we'll get a... He doesn't have really shared that with him yet, but... Uh, <laughs> So, but I, I, I know we've already been back and forth a bit on what we're going to talk about. It will be an interview, and the conclusion of the evening, we'll be giving him our Stegner Award for representing the values of the American West. And that is going to be a very moving, it be so moving, you'll want to bring your handkerchiefs for that, because it will be, um, in some weird way, I think it actually is going to be genuinely a meaningful activity for us all. Uh, not a weird way, because it's an important award. What am I saying? I'm saying... Uh, don't bring your handkerchiefs, but it will be a, uh, illuminating and intense evening. So I'm going to start us off tonight by making a statement. I am a member of the National Council on the Humanities, the governing board of the NEH, uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, and I am going to speak for a couple of minutes here not as a council member. What I will say next is just me, uh, Patty Limerick, citizen. So, on, in early November of 2016 there was an election and the results of that were not what the pundits were expecting. Oddly enough I spoke like the day after that I was at a I was speaking at a conference of, of the American Association of Political Consultants which was all of the panels were people who had screwed up on their polls. It was just a, I've never seen a more repentant and, re, and pathetic group of panelists because they were all saying, we thought we had this. So, in any case, I uh, do care about the humanities, whether I'm a council member or a citizen, and I did worry about what would happen to the National Endowment for the Humanities just as a citizen. Then, I got to know John Peaty, who was appointed as the acting chairman of, this, of the National Endowment for the Humanities and then was uh, confirmed by the Senate in April. And in the intervening period, uh, the president's budget called for the closing of the National Endowment for the Humanities, which did not help my spirits. Then, getting to know John Peaty, I met a person who uh, characterized himself as a person who builds things and doesn't end or close things. That seemed good. Uh, then I saw, I was fortunate to get to know aspects of his story, personal story. He grew up in a, a little town in Mississippi that had a utterly disproportionate uh, number of talented writers in it. So he was Oh, and I think, I think I can say this, that one of the talented writers, or a person who had extraordinary material, uh, was the town doctor, who knew everything about the town, and who kept very elaborate records, and had left those records uh, when he died too young, and that was John's father. So going through his father's records was a very interesting chance to see the power of the humanities and thinking about the the depths and range of human experience. So, just a number of things started adding up that made me more cheerful. And I do keep running into people who look at me in a Eeyore-ish manner and say, well, the endowment for the humanities is gonna be closed, it's gonna be shut down, and I think. There's plenty of things to worry about, and that doesn't happen to be one. So I am particularly pleased with that background to say that this has been uh, a wonderful opportunity to get to know a very interesting person, a very engaged and committed uh, participant in the humanities, and, and his background is uh, just a wonderful set of, of a chain of events that lead him to his current position as chair of the endowment. He 
uh, thought he would be a scientist or doctor, because that was certainly in his background. And then, if I'm going to, I hope I can quote this right. Let me get it right. Uh, that he, oh, he he went to college at Vanderbilt, and he took many science. He took many classes in different science disciplines, and he was defeated by all of those disciplines. That, that so, is accurate. <laughs> And uh, I don't think there's any word better than defeated uh, and uh, yes. well, quite and precise yeah. and apt. And I think it is important, those of you who want to tell inspirational tales to young people, you should know that not doing so well on his route to medical school, and in fact aborting the whole trip there of uh, the journey to medical school, he is now a great advocate for and supporter of the medical humanities. The whole project to introduce the narrative arts to doctors is a form of not a a side matter, but a really core way of getting to patients. So, so who knows those chemistry, organic chemistry paid off in some curious long, well, maybe not. Okay. So we'll let that go. But, uh, and then he, he went on to get a master's degree in Southern cultural studies at the University of Mississippi, where an old friend of mine, Bill Ferris was the person who headed that program and recruited him into it. So he got his master's degree there. And then uh, a strange thing happened that before he could go on to a PhD, he got a job, which that's not common. Worst for... things have happened in the humanities. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So he was an editor at Mercer University Press, and he had a, a great range of topics. And I think the fact that he was an editor will come back in terms of his stance towards the humanities today. So uh, he might actually... There's nothing more ridiculous than when I start to tell somebody's story and they're sitting right here and they could just be telling the story. So, but it is a great story and I'd be happy to get together with you in the weeks ahead and tell you the story again if you'd like to hear it because it is a really good one. And it's, a lot of it is about friendship and relationships as the way to end up positioned to do the right thing for your nation. So I am really pleased to have John Petey here with me. We thought about the sequence of topics we'd bring up, and we decided we would go into the uh, part that might be on the minds of many members of the audience, and might be, well, I think I wrote when I sent him the questions, I think question eight begins with uh, the most, this is the most sensitive of our topics, um, the most sen sensitive and as for especially careful review. So we're going in. Oh, so this is pretty interesting that the president declared his intention to close the NEH, and here we are um, with John Petey as our chairman. We ended up with $3 million more for the National Endowment for the Humanities than in the last year of the Obama administration. If we uh, wanted to join us in that. So that is a must be a very interesting story on how you were brought into an office to close an agency and instead the agency ended up with more money. So we would like you to come close the Center of the American West and then <laughs> see if you could get us. I, I hope the, the 140 characters allow somebody to tweet more than I hope you come to close the center. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, well, thanks. She, she said repeatedly since she's on our national uh, council that she's not able to apply for grants. And yet throughout the day she said nice things about me. So I do fear there is a grant from the, uh, the center somewhere at the endowment that I'm unaware of. Um, but, but Patty, and when we say Patty's on our national council, so uh, the NEH is a federal agency, we were, I'll, I'll come back to that, but we were uh, established by LBJ and we're, we're part of the Great Society legislation and the ethos of the NEA and the NEH, these sister agencies, comes through that. And uh, one part of the oversight is that each president will recommend national council members. So you have to be nominated by the president, you spend a, a good bit of time with your friends at the FBI, and then you go before the Senate for a vote. And so, and there are six year terms, and you serve until replaced. So uh, various people sometimes resign at the end of theirs, or a spouse moves to another nation and they need to you know, resign or health intervenes. So we have 26 potential members. We have three people that are appointed by President Bush. We have 18 for President Obama. We have five empty seats. 
And so you would say, well, of course, President Bush's term was not within the last six years. Those individuals have served 10 years. And I can tell you, if you were in a room and Patty was there and some of the Bush appointees there and, and, and uh, some of our new appointees of agency leadership, you wouldn't identify them. What you would see is a room of people who are committed in their personal lives and their professional lives to the arts and humanities, who believe that a, that a culture centered in learning is a culture they want to be a part of, we want to foster, we want to devote our lives to. So, so that's the culture of the agency. Um, so I have uh, had the, the honor and the pleasure of, um, I was appointed by President Bush at the National Endowment for the Arts, and I was there and I was uh, retained by the Obama administration uh, to oversee the funding of literature f uh, for the country. And uh, then I'm f for five years, I was at the University of Virginia, and then I was asked by the Trump administration to, to come on as, as we call them beachhead teams. I was the first appointee in, and for about, gosh, half a year, the only appointee in uh, the agency. And we did what we do. We talked about how do we go forward, what do we want to fund, what's, what's the vision for the agency. And so, while I don't, of course, ever go into my conversations with the White House, uh, I can say in broad strokes that when I was, uh, when I came on the agency in April of 2017, uh, the, the skinny budget, as it's called, that means here's what we intend to do. There's not a whole lot of language, but it, but it did name a budget of some 40 odd million dollars, and that would be the orderly closure of the agency. And to be clear, it was identified as not being a federal priority uh, of the administration. From that day to this day, I've never spoken with anybody in the White House who was derogatory about the arts or humanities, uh, dismissive. It is not the culture wars. I started in 2003. I understand what the culture wars are. That's not what's going on here. It's not a domestic spending priority. To the administration's credit, uh, because yes, I mean, you know, my Google, you know, can Google me. They had a resume. and. And what I do, for better or for worse, and certainly people can do it better, but I, I build cultural assets. And uh, I edit books, I publish books, uh, you know, I run um, projects. Uh, usually in literature, always around the issue of storytelling, whatever medium that might be. It might be filmmaking, it might be a book or magazine, but it's always about telling stories, which if you're going to be a Mississippian, that's kind of, you know, that's the home occupation. And... Uh, and to the credit, to the credit, the perspective of the White House is, you will every chairman submits the White House's budget. That's never changed since LBJ. That's how it works. And every chairman, every acting chairman submits the White House budget. You don't change a comma. You submit it to Congress. And I knew I would be doing so. But what they said, if it's the will of Congress that is closed, and that is the will, and I will oversee that in, in the most reasonable way I can, but you know, I have 140 people who report to me at work every morning and it's going to be a, a very personal and difficult experience, but we would do that. Uh, uh, if that's not the will of Congress, then the White House wanted somebody to run the agency that uh, understood the subject, was informed about the subject, and uh, I asserted that I was such a person in the room, and, um, and uh, over time I moved from the acting chairmanship uh, into uh, a Senate confirmation, and I was, I was um, honored to be unanimously, unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate. And uh, there has not been a whole lot of that uh, of, of late. And uh, I, I sometimes joke that that's why you pick a middle child such as me. Um, but, but I really I think, think that interesting remark about how there are fewer and fewer of those. Well, there, that yes, I mean that. Uh, that week, uh, Dr. Jackson went up as, as the BA nominee. Pompeo went up uh, for State Department. I no, went no, up. No, fewer and fewer of middle children. Oh well, yeah, I, I don't have the stats of that, but but I, those of us of a certain age can laugh because we know about what we mean about middle children being peacemakers. But but that makes the assumption you have at least three children, and statistically, that's I don't think that would resonate with the freshman class anywhere. Uh, but. Uh, uh, so, so basically, uh, I think uh, everything aside, it's the idea that the arts endowment, the humanities endowment. Uh, the will of Congress. I interrupted you. Uh, I interrupted you, and you were going to speak of uh, following the will of Congress, and that was going to get to you to the phrase that I have found so beautiful every time okay. you use it. Okay, there's a phrase I want you used, and I'm 
pretty sure one of the two is going to have a tattoo of it by the, the end of this trip. And I have opinions on which one I'd like it not to be. But um, uh, so, so I will say that uh, so we submitted our, our, our budget, and that goes into the House Interior Subcommittee. The Interior Subcommittee is important. Uh, committee, of course, of this state because they deal with energy policy. They deal with uh, federal lands, um, land rights, grazing rights, a, a lot of different matters. And they also deal with the uh, cultural agencies. And uh, so it's an interesting uh, agency. The state has always been well represented on, uh, on that, uh, on the House and the Senate on that committee. And so once the White House submits a budget, uh, as an agency chair, I can provide the Senate and the House with technical assistance, that's what the law says, technical assistance, uh, if, if requested of me. And, and one thing I've been very clear as acting chairman or, or, or as chairman is that I want to go to the Hill and I want to talk in a, in a very concrete way about how we're using tax dollars. And we think about a division in Washington, but I can tell you, you know, my agency, the White House is here and I have 535 members, for, you know, 420, uh, 435 on the House and 100 in the Senate, and all of them want to care about stewardship of tax dollars. There's no political party on that particular topic. And, and so I talk about the kind of things we're doing here. I talk about $250,000 for the online Colorado Encyclopedia. I talk about 40% of our grant dollars go to our state humanities partners. So in Colorado, most recently, for the State Humanities Council, that was about $775,000. And I'll be with Maggie and her team tomorrow at a high school at 8.30 in the morning. And we have a, uh, a humanities council member here, if you want to wave a hand. I don't know if there are other board members here. And um, by the end of the week, I'll be at the Air Force Academy uh, talking about the humanities and wartime writing and, and, and topics such as this. So uh, Congress, um, looking at how we serve the states and hearing from its constituents, um, did not, the technical assistance they wanted from me was not talk to me about this $40 million budget. It was talk to me about a $147 million budget or a $149 million budget. So when the omnibus bill passed uh, Congress last year and the president signed it into law last year, it was our biggest budget in five years. When the president signed the next omnibus bill in the spring of this year, it was our biggest budget in six years. And now the House and Senate Interior Subcommittees have recommended a, a $2.1 million increase and if that comes to pass, of course, it'll be the largest in seven years. Five million before that, or five and a half million before that, you're back to Ronald Reagan before you had a higher number. Uh, President Obama in his second year had 162 million, and that was the largest since Reagan. And um, so, so that's where we are. And so I understand if somebody uh, feels that uh, that there's, I understand about the existential crisis. I understand that that they uh, are focused on the on the budget submittal. And again, I am the individual that submits that budget. To be quite clear, uh, but uh, but but at no point am I said I'm instructed to say don't talk about how you're using the 153 million. It's just the opposite. As a member of the administration, I'm saying here's what we're doing with these monies, you know, you know, in your state or 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 for American history and civics, and. I think that one of the things as I go around the country, I've been to 22 states uh, since May of last year, and uh, I'm on my fourth state in the last uh, seven days, I think it is, as, um, whether I was in Mississippi, whether I was in Wyoming, Montana over the weekend, or, or here on this particular trip, is, is people have remarkable stories to tell. They have a remarkable history. They have the macro history of America, and they feel like their story, I think, in the South and the West, we feel like our story isn't always included, or it's told in a way we would not tell it. It is told by outsiders, and we don't want to whitewash our history. We don't want to obscure our history. We would want to play, I think, a bigger role in telling our history. And so I'm spending a lot of time just listening. You know, what are we, what are we doing well? What could we do better? Um, and, and what I love is this council that has served some of them for a decade that y'all are as excited about this as, as I am. And, uh, 
And uh, I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm a Mississippian, so once I start a roll, I either you know pass a hat for a collection or something. So we'll we'll, we'll stop there. And and the idea is that we'll do this a bit, and then it'll be opened up to questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to go to the concern about the possibility of funding projects that become controversial and that are um, grist for the mill of people who would like to oppose funding for the arts and the humanities. And I'm going to say, this is, I'm not sure this question appeared on the list, um, but I'm going to say that I think I, after my years with the Center of the American West, am maybe more eager than you are to make sure that we don't expose a flank by funding a project that is not well thought out, that has a foregone conclusion, that has an ax to grind, that is not a real inquiry, but is, I, I so personally, as a council member, do not want to be the one who brought a punishing and unfortunate uh, reaction that might interrupt that growth in the budget. So when we are talking about this, I am very alert to that possibility that we could, and I, I don't, I can't remember the timing exactly, but the, you, well, you were at the National Endowment for the Arts, and there were episodes where funded projects were very controversial and created quite an uproar over National Endowment for the Arts funding. So could you talk about that whole, I don't know if it's a balance beam or tightrope or whatever, but just a lot rests on not pulling either of those agencies into an unproductive fray. And that concerns me a lot. So I'm, I'm going to put, postulate that I might be more attuned and anxious about that than you are. Uh, no, I appreciate that. Um, the most controversial thing we can do, and something I will not do, is fund mediocrity. I mean that. I mean, the absolute thing is the natural ally for the humanities, this idea that, that we want to, we want to be the, the equivalent of our, our federal sister agencies, the way NASA has an aspirational aspect, the way um, uh, other, um, my friends in DOD who deal with wound care. So my, my thing is worrying about operating from a, a position of fear. You know, I could, you can sit in and at the agency um, I'll fly back at midnight, and I'll, I'm going to go to a black tie thing at the Kennedy Center. The whole chairmanship can be black tie events, and, and that's great, and I need to be in the room with some of those decision makers. Uh, but, uh, but why would you? Why, you know, why would you squander you know, the, the opportunity? So, so for me, I, I go back to some bedrock ideas, the same ones that, that are reinforced by council members, is, is this idea of intellectual rigor in all things. And so if we want to use the word of what you're describing, this hypothetical proposal, that it edges so close to advocacy, we, we worry about that. And my thing is, at a certain point, for what we do, the way we define our guidelines, if you're engaged in advocacy on a particular uh, political perspective, uh, uh, then, then you have stepped away from, I think, intellectual rigor, and, and you are instead engaged in another activity, a perfectly fine activity, but not one we federally fund, uh, and certainly not through this agency. And so, and I, I think scholars in particular are really in a difficult time here, because if you're a scholar and you have a topic and it's about, uh, um, uh, if it's set in the 19th century before the Civil War and you want to talk about that topic, um, and any number of polarizing things between political parties, and you're submitting it to a commercial publishing house, they want that epilogue or the description or the prologue to talk about it in the context of today's political parties, to try to uh, make something. And that's not the root of your work, but you're sending it in. Your, your colleagues are saying that's, you know, that might be something you want to do. Your editor at major New York publishing house is saying that's what you want to do. That may be perfectly fine, and when you finally publish a book in five years, you may have gotten rid of all that stuff. It will not be accurate. 
um, but you send it into us, and we think, oh my goodness, is this going to be you know a partisan, uh, uneven a, a work of advocacy? So I think sometimes, um, as a writer, by the time you're chasing the latest trend and your book actually gets edited and comes out and is marketed, that trend is gone. So at the agency, we don't invest in presentism. In other words, we're trying to take the historical perspective. I can tell you when I was at the National Endowment for the Arts, um, I, uh, you know, I, I loved that position. It was a great place for me. And, and a couple of things. Um, one, about this idea of not living in fear and a, a constant crouch. And sometimes you're going to make decisions, and you just have to take the heat at the moment. So the National Endowment for the Arts funded the design competition of the Vietnam War Memorial. That right there, you would say as citizens, I bet all of us, is that's money I believe in, it's well spent, and I, I believe in that agency in part because of that. I can tell you in the Washington Post, it was called a black gash in the earth. It was, a, it was considered a, an offensive act. There was represent, representational art put at the end, a, be, a rather beautiful sculpture, of course, it's still there, uh, to offset this idea. And uh, we were on the right side of history. Um, and it, sometimes it's hard to understand if you will be on the right side of, of history or not on, on these kind of things. But you, you really have to be willing to go forward. And you have to be willing and all candor to be subjected to a bit of personal demonization. And that's much worse in the moment of, of social media. Um, and, 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 and that's just a reality of serving in this manner. Well, and presentism, if it's, if it's drawing relevance of a, from a humanity study that is so tied to a particular moment that it's going to be as dated as yesterday's newspaper, I can see that. But you seem to be very unrelenting in wanting to push the case for Americans to look at their heritage and its full cultural diversity. And we, if council members thought, oh, here is a person we don't really know, we'll have to make sure that he becomes alert to and responsive to and sensitive to uh, the multicultural richness of our country. We didn't have to uplift you. We didn't have to say, oh, John, you're a Southern fellow and there's uh, very significant African-American writers and you should be paying attention to them. I mean, that's, you knew all that. So, so you're not saying keep it disconnected, keep these studies disconnected from our present moment, you are frequently saying to the American people, pay attention to this whole range of cultural diversity, pay attention to the diversity of writers in the South and in the West, and notice, so, so talk a little bit more about what you want. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, if you tell a history of, of America and you leave out my state, so I, my last position in Mississippi is 70%, African-American city and some remarkable things. I was there with the governor last Monday dedicating uh, the marker outside of Eudora Welty's house. I could have driven two miles away and there was Jackson State where Alice Walker, who we know for the author of Color Purple, she was there with Bill Ferris, uh, you know, who of course later became my mentor and NEH chair. A mile past that was where Megar Evers was assassinated. Now my father moved from Alabama to Mississippi because three miles that way was where the first time they ever put uh, a heart transplant, they put a primate's heart into a human being, and it transformed the world. And so um, in the telling of, uh, of the full fullness of that state is the state where we had assassinations, and we had uh, Miss Welty, as we call her, and we also had uh, Dr. James Hardy's transplant. He did the first heart-lung transplant uh, in the world. Uh, in that same city. And so that's just telling about American history. When I, when I left the Mississippi Delta and, I, and, and won a Dockery Farm, which was uh, actually wasn't part of a plantation, it was a sharecropping town, but you had Charlie Patton and you had Muddy Waters and you had B.B. King there. And this is just a, you know, a field at this point. And, and they transformed American music there. And so when I left there and I went to Cody and I had a great, I mean, incredible museum there, you know, the Buffalo Bill Center, uh, but we drove a few miles away and the shadow of Heart Mountain was a Japanese American internment camp. And when we left there, uh, we went to, the, the, you know, Crow Agency in Montana uh, to the to Little Bighorn um, College. And I was there with a wonderful scholar, uh, Janine Peace. And uh, I'm, I, 
Patty and Janine, I'm going to say you're more or less the same generation. They both have MacArthur Fellows. Patty doesn't bring it up. If I had one, I'd wear it in a baseball cap. You know? <laughs> but um, you know, these are known as the Genius Grants. And I think about these retar re remarkable women who transformed American history of the West and the resources of her institution that requires la native language immersion in Crow language. And they have about, you know, they have fewer than 300 students and, and modest resources, but an incredible archive. And I think about the wonderful resources of this institution, the center. And the agency, my agency, has to be open and available and listening and learning from both. And so, so that's the idea. And, and having that one week, if we think about the African American experience in America, we think about the Native American experience in America, we think about the, in, the interned Japanese Americans experience. That is a full telling of an American experience. And, and, I, uh, and I don't say that as, as an apologist. I, I, I think that we've been a remarkable experiment. Um, I do not look at another government or another nation and say there is, is what I seek. What I want to do is tell more fully who we are. And if, if you allow me, um, I think I. If I quote things, I mean, it'll be very close to right, but maybe I should say they're all rough, possibly paraphrases. But, but Thomas Jefferson, complicated individual you know, that he was, full of contradiction, as we all are. But in a letter in 1816, he's writing to somebody. So this isn't a famous speech. This is just Jefferson's mind at work. And uh, he says something that really guides me. Uh, he says, a nation that expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, expects what never was and will never be. And so if you want to know what the humanities are about at, on this campus, in this state, at the national level, what the agency is about, we are a wall against ignorance. We are steadfastly driving forward a commitment to freedom. And it is inconceivable that you have civilization at any point separate of the humanities. So I, I sometimes put that up. Is, is, you know, Jefferson is a founder, and again, with all his incompleteness, and sometimes to pair it off, I will take my reading from uh, Zornel Hurston. I, at the NEA, I was the director of the Big Read, if y'all know that uh, project, and that was a, a great part of my career, and I loved it. And Zornel Hurston's The Eyes Were Watching God was part of this. A lot of us know her as a novelist, African-American novelist, and a folklorist. And uh, I love all the research we've heard today, the advanced humanities research that's going on here, the digital humanities. But sometimes when I get so in that esoteric word, world, I come back to Zornel Hurston, and I've said this in print and other places. Uh, she was asked about research, and she said it's formalized curiosity. And I love that too. So I mean, that's my shorthand. What business are you in? I'm in the business of curiosity. Exploring it, producing it, preserving it, you know, expanding. So you mentioned the baseball cap that might say. So yeah. uh, we have, I think we've come up with a hopeful uh, design for a t-shirt today. And I'm going to quote the phrase of yours that seems like we would all wear it as a t-shirt. It says, Tocqueville, not trolls. Yeah. Yeah, Tocqueville over trolls. Uh, to Tocqueville over trolls. Tocqueville over trolls. Uh, could you explain the genesis of that and where we can buy our t-shirts? Um, that I, I don't... Uh, um, I don't know if I heard it from somebody or not, um, but at least I said it in print, so I'll, I'll argue for it if there's a t-shirt royalties. Um, but it was a conversation. I was asking our humanities magazine, I, I did an interview that's online now, and uh, it was a question of freedom of expression on, on campuses, you know, where do your rights begin and where do mine end and this kind of thing. and and. Uh, is somebody's values and conduct and theories so offensive that you should shout them down or protest and what have you? And, uh, and I said, I won't go into it here, but I said, I'm pretty much where the University of Chicago has been on this. They had a, a statement about the uh, freedom of expression. And um, in general, they felt that when you go into the world, you know, you, you don't get to police every little, you know, I don't like your cubicle this way and this way. And the idea that in, in the world, you deal with a lot of complexity of a lot of people have a lot of different values that may be different from yours. And you have to finally na navigate that. And that we want to be watchful in our campuses if we teach somebody that uh, you can only have an, uh, an independent thought within the chalked lines and, and, and what have you. And so 
I do affirm that Chicago position about uh, allowing views. If, if for four years that I was educated, I only had people that agreed with me and I was at Amen Corner, I, it would be a, a deficient education. Having said that, um, I said as a citizen, as a parent, a taxpayer a citizen, um, I do make value judgments. My entire job is to make value judgments, say I'll fund this, not that. They, mo they might be both great, they might not, but I, I make value judgments for a living. And uh, so I did say that, um, that we can bring discernment, we can say uh, what we stand for, and, and um, is a difference between rational presenting. I, I, I was pretty precise in writing, so I would point you to that for the most precise wording. But, but a rational position that you don't agree with is something that I believe uh, belongs on our, our campus. Um, you know, coming or a ranting white supremacist, uh, as a parent and a taxpayer, I do not want to federally subsidize that act. Um, but, and then I went on to say, Tocqueville over, over trolls. Yeah. So, and I want to be clear, I'm talking about subsidizing an act versus banning an act. There's a lot of nuance uh, there, but, uh, but it's, it's um, uh, we, are, we have had overreactions, and, um, and I don't believe um, an act of violence uh, on, uh, to pre prevent a speaker on campuses. Is, is acceptable under any, any terms. Uh, and speaking of campuses and professors and connecting hum humanity studies to the present, I, I'm going to get this story wrong, but I believe, or subtly wrong, uh, that when Hubert Humphrey was supporting the creation of the National Endowment for the Humanities and wanting the humanities to have a funding source that would be uh, comparable, though smaller, with science funding, my understanding is that uh, something went awry where humanities professors were brought to testify on behalf of this, and they sadly became uh, ultra-professorial and pontificated and spoke in a not particularly engaging way to the public, and that uh, Hubert Humphrey really had to call in some chits for that. that his, that it's possible for, I don't know, think I have the story exactly right, but there is something that might have happened right at the start where professors preoccupied with narrow research interests might have weakened the initial start of the creation of your agency. So I want to talk about this whole matter of getting professors and, and their research fully engaged with the public, fully benefiting the public, and uh, I'm going to quote from you that in, right, in speaking of, of how literature can be, can be taught, um, this is a remark about, you could certainly make this for any other humanities field. I, this is a quotation from you. I wish that we would spend more time talking how we came to love these literary works as opposed to chasing buried messages between sentences. Now, that could be, we could walk a few, hundred yards and we could be in some office spaces where those would be fighting words, would they? Or? Uh, it's always makes you nervous if somebody reads you back something in front of our audience and I, I think being recorded and says, do you still stand by these words? I, I do stand by those words. Um, uh, I, I won't, uh, so the, the groups that advise on the establishment of the agency, there were three cultural groups and any number of, of professors that, that weighed in. And, some of those groups have played a vital role, of Phi Beta Kappa and others, over the, over the decades. Um, so I won't uh, get into that or not. I, I think uh, the movement of government and legislation through Congress is, is not always a transparent act. Uh, I'm, um, uh, I'm the first chairman we've ever had who's been a federal grant maker before, and I'm about a decade into being a, a appointee of the two endowments. And, and that, um, I'll have some deficiencies, but, but one of the advantages will be you just understand naturally how, how, how these things work. Um, and uh, so I don't know if that's a compliment that bureaucracy is, is you know, the code I put on every day. Um, but uh, but that, that quote about literature, um, and I, so I, you know, edited books in terms of being a university press, editing other people's books. I, I edited, co-edited a book on Flannery Economy myself. I worked with a 
Mexican government to introduce uh, contemporary American writers in, in a bilingual project. And uh, so I've done some scholarship, you know, maybe, you know, 100 works of literary criticism and journalism over the years, because I'm not really so much a writer as an editor, but, you know, 100 works is still 100 works. And, uh, but I think two things where I would really love the Academy to think through differently. One, I think we introduce literary theory into the undergraduate education too early, and I think it chases people off, for example, my field of, of literature. I think it's more, uh, more of an issue in literature than, say, history. Um, for Father's Day, you know, all across the country, everybody's getting, you know, the David McCullough, John Adams, for every father, so they can have a thousand page book they won't read, or, or you know, the greatest generation. There's no equivalent, like we didn't all rush out and give, you know, Harold Bloom's book, though I'd be fine with that, or, you know, there's a finite amount of literary people we would do that with, uh, but we would do that uh, in some other disciplines, um, but not literature. So I think we've introduced literary theory too early. Second, in general, across all the humanities, I wish we would take our finest teachers, the ones who are teachers, which is not always the same as being a fine researcher and we would put them in their introductory classes. Because when I get in front of a classroom, I want to talk about why I love it. You know, why, when I, I, the book I did uh, on Flannery O'Connor, I came at her first as somebody who loved her, her work. And I mean, she was a, um, you know, she could be a bit of a grouch. Um, she, uh, she was asked once, uh, you know, at a forum not unlike this, um, do we do enough um, to encourage young writers? And she said, encourage, I don't think we do enough to discourage them. And, and, uh, and I think, by the way, what she meant by that and, uh, is that um, it's a complicated life, the life of the mind, and particularly of the creative writer, is financially strong, uh, uh, the, the way she was as an independent short story writer and novelist. Um, and the act of discouraging for her was the idea that you should do with your life what you're passionate about. And I do wish in our classrooms we would talk more about passion and more about what we loved. And so, uh, and, and, and so you know, I think about Robert Penn Warren, great, great poet. Of course, you know him as he's the only uh, writer to win the Pulitzer in two genres. He won it for his novel, All the King's Men. He won two other Pulitzers for poetry. And that great poem he has about Audubon, a uh, book-length poem. And at the end of it, he says, um, in this time and place, of mania, tell me a story, tell me a story of deep delight. And what if we don't do that in grad school? We, we lay it on the table and we dissect it and, and, and we find that uh, Flannery O'Connor was doing this because, because she was a Catholic in the Protestant South and she did this because she had lupus and she was dying of it, her father died of it and he was complicated because he was shell shot from World War I and there was no treatment for that PTSD. And, and I'm all for learning all that. I am all for it. But let us begin and end always in the place of why we love it. And, and, um, and, and I wish we had more of that. And so I stand by it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the things you've said uh, the last day here is that by being an editor, your stance as NEH chair has been quite different because you will have to ask the question, who's the audience? Which all the scholars who have preceded you in that position, that may not have been the first thing in their minds. Well, first thing, I mean, I, I follow in the footsteps of just remarkable, remarkable people. Um, and I would say, in general, um, uh, um, my superior in every way as scholars. And, and, and they're all asking a multitude of questions, but, but I do come at it as, as an editor, certainly. And so, who's the audience? Of course, the audience is the American people. One day, it's Congress, it's White House, it's, it's fellow granters. You know, it's a lot of different people. And so, I'm telling a lot of different stories. Um, if a scholar, if you're a scholar and you immediately go into this job, then you're probably um, saying, what can I do to advance the careers of other scholars? Which is a very noble goal, and it's a byproduct of what we do. Um, and I'm for that, and I'm doing that. Having said that, um, I'm thinking about how do we embed the humanities into our communities and our culture outside our campus walls 
in a way that it defines and transforms our communities. And so that's talking to your audience in a little bit of a different way. That's talking about the public humanities in a, in a different way. That means that, for example, I was trained in the Western canon in a very traditional way, but I believe in oral histories, which are essential to Native American cultures and, and African American culture, if you're going to tell the story before you know, the, the uh, Reconstruction period. And I believe in that because, for example, I was trained in Homer. And if you don't believe in oral history, then you have no interest in Homer. You know, you have no interest in Beowulf, you know, and so forth. So I think sometimes we say, well, you can either like a multicultural curriculum or you can like the Western canon, but you can't like both. And, and, a, and, and that's ill-informed. And, and, uh, and I don't know why, uh, you know, we can't be more expansive in, in our thinking. So we're spending a lot of time going around the country talking to groups that aren't putting everything in a box. Um, and having worked at the Arts Endowment and the Humanities Endowment, I understand why we have university departments and we need them. But out in the world, as citizens, I, I don't go to an event and say, well, now I'll have my arts day and then maybe I'll get my humanities day. No, I'm going to have my enriching cultural experience. And, and, uh, and these are very fluid matters. And so um, I would like the endowment to think about that more holistically. You know? So I have just two questions before we go to the rest of the group. And <clears throat> the first <clears throat> one is to ask you to speak about um, your work with soldiers and how that began and how that went on and what places you traveled to and who you worked with. And I hope that you'll get to the phrase of how in this project you'll speak of the request which writers honored was to park their politics before they went into the work that you were coordinating. So. Sure. Okay, and um, um, I'll do that. So um, I'll back up a little bit and say, so I finished grad school. Um, I become a university press editor. I go back to a, another college, and I'm running publications and communications. And I'd met a visiting writer uh, when I was a book editor. In that first few months after Bill Ferris had recommended me for this job, I met a coworker in, in a small office that did the really terrible idea of falling in love with a coworker. And since we've been married 25 years, it worked out. But boy, if it had not, that was going to be an unfortunate place to work. And I went to the airport to pick up the visiting writer. And in general, if the visiting writer can later be named chairman of a federal agency, that's the right person to pick up. So yes, in some ways, I, when I taught the students to say the, the, the important point is to be lucky in life. But the reality is, is to put in the work. So I went to pick up that visiting poet, Dana Joya, and he had just published Camp Poetry Matter in the Atlantic, and he was kind of at the height of his, uh, you know, of, of fame at that moment, and a great poet. And we stayed in touch for a decade. We corresponded. We sent writing back and forth. So a decade goes by. I'm running a communications office at a college. President Bush names, uh, nominates him as chairman of the NEA, and Chairman Joya says, will you come to Washington? and be my speechwriter. I said yes, and I was appointed as a speechwriter. Except he's a better writer than I am, and, and he didn't need me to be a speechwriter. And we're about a month in this job. I'm his aide de camp, his, his counselor officially. And uh, I'm maybe you know, 30 years old. I'm a little, little green. And, uh, uh, and we're at the gathering of the state poet laureates, and it's a bar, and it's midnight. If you want, and 49 of the 50 state poet laureates were there. And, uh, Bars, you know, a natural place to then conduct business. And it was April of 2003. Okay, so we're already in Afghanistan. We're rolling toward Baghdad. And we're there with Marilyn Nelson. She's the poet laureate of Connecticut. She's the daughter of Tuskegee Airmen. She's a pacifist and a peace activist. She also, though, had just spent uh, the last year teaching at West Point. And if West Point, uh, U.S. Military Academy at West Point adopts your book, as the, every cadet reads it coming in, then you teach there. And she said, I'm a pacifist. They said, fine, I'm a, you know, everything. They go down the list. And, and she said, and I want to teach poetry and meditation. She thought she had finally given them the one thing they couldn't do. They said, fine, teach poetry and meditation. And what she was saying to Dana is, and she said, um, uh, my cadets are going to war. And, uh, you know, all my classmates, when we went to Vietnam, and said, you know, we protested. And I said, I don't, I don't think we did them right. And they weren't welcome back. And uh, I don't want to see it to happen to these young boys and, and girls. 
And so Chairman Joya, we thought the war would be a few months, you know, and he said, well, John will run it. If you can keep your politics off the basis. And he said, I'm not debating what, you know, I know 90% of our writer friends, but you keep your politics off the basis. So we got Tobias Wolf, and then we, you know, and other Vietnam vets, uh, I went to, you know, to interview Shelby Foote, he was 88, it was 16 years after Ken Burns. If Ken Burns got to him when he was, mo his voice sounded like Moses on the Civil War, by the time I got to him, he was God, you know, and, and he wasn't going to do the interview, but I said, well, you know, sir, I'm from Mississippi, and he's like, okay, because you know, I'm in the tribe, you know, and, and so I went to Memphis, and I interviewed him about serving in World War II. Um, and Richard Wilbur and, and all these World War II vets. And so that was going to be a side project on a short war. And I spent eight years uh, in Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, Bahrain, Persian Gulf, um, military hospitals, uh, various parts of the world, and uh, 30 domestic bases. And what we did is we went and we used either a, a work of uh, oral history and then writing workshops of samples and we said, send us your wartime experiences. We wanted to have something cathartic. And 10,000 pages of writing came in. Random House published the book, edited by Andrew Carroll. Uh, the independent film that Peter Jennings started before he died during production uh, was a finalist for the Oscar. And this happened because two poets were in a bar at midnight, and they said, what if? What if? And uh, along the way, distinguished professors, uh, talented professors, uh, uh, called Chairman Joy and I uh, war propagandists in writing. We're a partner with DOD because that's how you get on a base. Um, and, and I do not apologize for that. I'm going to the Air Force Academy on Thursday and Friday to talk about that uh, experience. And, uh, and the toughest part, you want to talk about it? I don't, I don't sweat the controversies and the fear. Again, I care about rigor. The hardest part of being a federal grant maker is, you know, sitting in what was the old post office, now the Trump Hotel, and, when I, and the chairman has the turrets, the chairman do, is the old postmaster's office. And I saw uh, the Washington Monument, my phone rings at seven or eight. Maybe my daughter's five or six, you know, and I haven't been home at a reasonable hour, and I don't know when. And uh, I turned down a piece of writing for that. We got 10,000 pages. We put probably 800 manuscript pages in that book. And... Uh, a woman's son had drowned in uh, training to be a SARS rescue, you know, the kind of the lead of the lead, the kind of uh, Navy SEAL of rescue, and he had drowned, and we, we, couldn't, we couldn't find a path to put in the book. And she said, you know, it's, you're saying his life didn't matter, you know? You're saying, you know, that, I mean, it just didn't happen. This, you know, like, you, you know, you're, this is a wound all over again, what you've done to me. And I just remember the, the grief of it. And, um, and nothing I said was the right thing to say. And I think uh, what I needed to be was something that she could send that out and get it out of her body and, and toward me. But when I'm going back on the metro, and it's late, and I'm going to the end of the line of the metro, and I had, you know, I had Dylan Thomas in my mind. And I, and I go back, and uh, I had to get my old anthology from college to remind me. And, you know, we say in English not to begin with a conjunction, and we don't want you to be repetitive. Uh, but I can tell you what I looked at was, and death shall have no dominion. The beginning line of the poem, it began with a conjunction. Every stanza begins with it. Every stanza ends with it. The poem ends with it. And death shall have no dominion. And everything about those eight years of federal service were about death shall have no dominion. And, and I think in some, in some manner that's, that's what you and I are after, right? I mean, that, that it will not hold sway over us. Yeah. So my uh, final question is pointing out something that apparently had not struck you, that you are younger than your agency. As your agency celebrated its 50th birthday in 1965, and you have, you're just edging up on celebrating your 50th birthday, is that right? So to have you be the first chairman who was younger than the agency, uh, that seems to position you to say, what about this age, what are the traditions of the National Endowment for the Humanities that must be preserved? What are the traditions that should be uh, remodeled, adapted? What are things that made sense uh, decades ago and are really not quite fitting us now? Sure. Well, it's interesting you said remodeled because uh, I, I'm 
remodeling our 1980s bathroom in our basement, and I, I feel a lot older than 50, let me tell you. And uh, uh, as um, um, don't 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 tile bathrooms to unwind from your federal service. I think is um, I'm going to do federal service for dummies, and that's the first page, uh, so you get it free here. Um, so, so yes, so we've had 11 uh, chairmen, and so the federal agencies, you're called, it's gendered chairman, whether you're male or female, but a couple of points there, if we want to talk about changing it, Lynn Cheney is the only female since 1965 to ever serve uh, as chairman. I believe everybody's uh, been Caucasian. It's been different on the art side. Chairman Joya is Hispanic, Jane Chu is Asian American. Uh, but uh, uh, so all of the chairmen before me, were born in the 1910s, 1910s, 30s, and 40s, with the next youngest being born during the Truman administration. So, so it is uh, a difference in the sense that I never had a full-time professional job when the internet didn't exist. Um, the digital humanities are just the humanities to me. Um, we still refer to things as born digital, but really, frankly, they're just born. You know, um, and so when I see in the academy the innovators and the kind of young grantees are doing podcasts for dissertations, and I and, and they're talking about maker studios and they're talking about experiential learning, but then they're going into the old system to try to get tenure. Then you hope you have somebody who's a gatekeeper, such as Patty or or some of the other professors I met here, that are open to that. There aren't going to be a barrier to that. Who aren't going to say no. Uh, tenure looks like a monograph book that 150 people are going to buy that cost $160, you know, and is written in a specialist language. But instead, um, it's the idea that if we can have the public humanities, then we could talk about energy policy as, 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 in a scholarly way, that we could talk about conservation, that we can talk about migration patterns in the nation in a scholarly way that the academy accepts and the public learns from. And so, um, I am spending a lot of time talking about, uh, for example, my job isn't to reward great grant writing. The big institutions have sponsored research office. They can write it five or six times. They can fly their scholars to Washington. And, and the professors are teaching a lighter load if they're at a distinguished institution such as this. I'm leaving tribal colleges and universities, so that's not the case. They're teaching four or four loads college presidents that don't have an administrative system, so they answer their own phone. And, and they're, they're engaged, and they're driven, and they're passionate. And maybe that draft didn't get four going overs, you know. And, and part of what I want to say to the smaller institutions, uh, underserved institutions, wherever they may be, which, by the way, can very much be LA or New York or Chicago or Miami, is that um, I am not focus or over focus on the grant writing. I want to know if you receive these federal funds, what would you do? And why would it matter? And so, so many times we are reporting activities. I don't care about activities, I care about outcomes. And so I want to move the needle. And I don't think that's unique to me. I think other chairmen have certainly had that idea. I've certainly been successful in it and I'm learning from them. Uh, but if you asked um, where do I come at it, that's that's certainly one way that I, that I come at this matter. So I uh, will take a few questions, and then after three or four questions, you'll quote André Gide. Oh, okay. So don't do that just yet. It's supposed to be very natural. <laughs> it will be. Everyone will have she, forgotten when, that I said when, that. When she <laughs> sent me questions, I said they're fine, and I glanced at them, but I didn't want to read them because I would you know, be robotic. But, uh, but You being robotic, I don't see as a real threat there. I'm OK with that. Uh, so a, a few questions. Yes. Uh, so, so I, I teach in the humanities department and the philosophy department here, and I think uh, those of us who teach in the humanities are keenly aware of a sense that the humanities are somewhat under siege these days. And we look at declining enrollments in, in classes and a, kind of a general sense that, uh, well, the humanities are maybe kind of marginal yeah. to what people care about. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder what your take on all of that is. No, I appreciate it. I mean, I don't know, the Chronicle Higher Education has a new lengthy humanities article once uh, every two weeks, you know. Uh, and I'm in a peculiar thing, if I retweet it, people think I'm endorsing it, no matter whatever the, the line may say. But um, 
I think as a book editor, I just want to publish them at the end of every month and, you know, into some book. Um, the humanities are, for lack of a better word, either seen as declining enrollment or under siege in some ways. And um, I've had versions of conversation with maybe a dozen faculty members today, your dean and provost who, who made time for, for um, uh, useful meetings today. Um, I would say this. Uh, college is very expensive. Uh, parents are more than ever focused on how can we economically, you know, get on the back end what we pay for. And, uh, and they view that as engineering, business, you know, <coughs> these, these other fields. Um, the thing is, statistics don't always back that up. Um, uh, that um, something, you know, the same, your provost sees the same numbers I do, which is, those individuals in the humanities, when you look at income of five or 10 years out, the, the highest level comp uh, compensation on that uh, is gonna overlap with the, the lower level compensation of an engineer or something. So one, um, economically, it's always driven by the success of the individual. I do believe quite strongly in the individual. If you wanna talk about generalist numbers, um, it's an underappreciated fact that if you want to matriculate into medical school, English and music are the two uh, most, cons most consistently decade after decade. Those are the fields to be in. Um, when um, MIT did a study, and I'll have this part very much a paraphrase and I can find it more precisely, but, but they looked at uh, the skills that their engineers, their graduates needed. And within four years, the actual training in the classroom of a technical nature was already obsolete. Um, the same way my, uh, uh, we've known each other since college. Uh, if we were still doing Fortran with those cards in college, you know, um, we're not doing a whole lot of that anymore. Um, I can tell you um, that what I learned about uh, the um, Roman and Greek civilization in the classics department of Vanderbilt is still useful in Washington, D.C. every day of the week. Um, and uh, so we teach essential life skills, and I think it's important. I'm not the first person to say that the humanities don't, it's not so much about preparing you for the salary of your first job, but it's preparing you for a career. Um, if I would add one more day to a college campus visit, I would meet with a career center, and I'd meet with a college admissions office. Because college admissions are generally done by undergraduates only a few years out. They have just come out of the influence of the parents who understandably and rightfully fear. And I, I have an 18-year-old who's enrolled in college um, at a wonderful and expensive uh, university, and she's a violist. So, you know, her, I, you know, you know here I am, I'm writing poetry, and her, her mother's an uh, ordained Southern Baptist minister. So it's not like we pick the practical, lucrative field. So I really can't knock her for falling in love with classical music. But um, she also... Uh, um, like any number of people in the humanities, I, I think is destined for a full and engaged life as a citizen. And so we need to make an economic argument. We need to talk about life skills and we need to talk about developing careers. Because I would not build an entire agency around the securing of the first job at the age 22. I want to know at 32, 42, 52, and 62, do you have the life skills to, to have, you know, an economically viable life? And is it an enriched life and, and a life that you, you give back to your community? Um, I don't know that we've done the greatest job on that. I, I think we have too often said, eat your spinach, you know. Um, the other thing is humanities are absolutely declining. There are stories within that. Um, rhetoric has kind of gone as a field in some ways. Sociology is, is kind of caught between anthropology, went toward the hard sciences, psychology went toward pharma and other things. And some, some areas are gonna be a little lost, but I, I'll, I'll quickly, uh, and I'll try to quickly get to this. I don't have a great sense of time, but I could, could I spend three or four minutes on something? Because it really matters. You asked me 15 years ago where philosophy was. I would have probably off, my, off the cuff said, Gosh, I, I don't know if you make an argument for the undergraduate or master's degree in philosophy and there aren't enough tenure track jobs for the doctorate position. I think I might have made that argument, not from a position of knowledge, but I could have said that off the cuff at a panel. Um, 
that would be profoundly ignorant um, in this moment because you cannot have any informed conversation or decision making about artificial intelligence without having a core philosophy field, which is, say, ethics. So, and I don't know if, um, I believe at one point, some hypotheticals were set up in an Atlantic Magazine article. So this could derive from a premise they have. But if I, on the, um, I don't know how much it matters if I move from the camera, but, but we'll, just, um, we'll just say that, um, that I, you know, we're, we're in a car. We're both in a car moving, it's a self-driving car. And, and uh, it's a two-lane road. We're driving this way, there's traffic coming this way, okay. A dog runs out in front of us, in, you know, and we're going 10 miles an hour in a self-driving car, sees that, starts actually beeping before it crosses into the roadway, and goes into this lane. Okay, you can program it. Engineer would program it to go into this lane. Okay. We're going 10 miles an hour, the same thing happens, but there's a car there. Maybe you, if you program in that, we're going to hit our bumpers, we're going to, you know, mess up the front, we're going to save the dog's life. I don't think the decision is going to be that you do that. I think the, the engineers might just say, well, hit the dog. You can't intentionally drive into another vehicle that exposes you legally to a lot of things. That's what the lawyers might say and the engineers might program it. Okay, so we have that, and we're not yet, there's no ethicist involved in this conversation yet. The dog got loose and the seven-year-old girl is going behind it, after it. You can hit the dog, maybe the scientists say. You, it's the seven-year-old girl's, quote, fault, right, in the sense that you do not go into her path. You would deviate, not the run of the seven-year-old girl, the engineers would tell you, and you would go, and you would hit this car at 10 miles an hour. And maybe you're going to lose in court. Now you're not going 10 miles an hour, everything I just told you, but you're going 50. If you deviate from that girl and hit a car head on at 50 miles an hour and you kill them, it's manslaughter. Some engineer just put the, if you do not have an ethicist helping you think through that, if you do not have an ethicist involved in Facebook and all them when they're trying to figure out what ads to run before an election, then you have built a company that will ultimately fail, period. No caveat. So I can tell you that I thought a humanities field was theoretical and, and maybe out of its moment. Not from any insight, frankly, you know, not as a, somebody within the field. Of, and, and now I can tell you that, um, that if I was educating engineers, you know, you would have, a, I don't care if it's bioethics or ethics or, or ethics of land management, but you would have something. And I'll quickly say this in a little bit of a pitch. So the five years that I was at UVA between the endowments of the University of Virginia, I was under the vice president of research, Tom Scalak, and they got some fun, uh, money, I think government money, and the Chesapeake Bay uh, had been polluted, you wouldn't want to drink it or swim in it, whatever. And basically all the cut of waste was coming down from the New England area and nitrates running off from fertilizer and, and, and what have you. It was killing all the oysters. And the Bay game is this, is computer modeling simulation is sort of for high schools and middle schools, but there are live ones you can do in museums. And so you're an oysterman and you want to, ma you want to send your kids to college and, and you want to maximize it because you've got to pay off your big boat. And then, and so you take, uh, you take whatever, am I still okay? Yeah. You take whatever the normal harvest is and you increase it by 25%. All right, I own the land up there. I, you know, it's been two rough years in a row and it's great weather and I'm going to fertilize this stuff like crazy because I'm going to make a great harvest. Prices are up, we're exporting heavily. And so you do that and I do that. Um, I've killed your oyster beds and you, even if I did nothing, have killed them because there are enough to reproduce. And, and there are any number of groups from people that have tour ships to whatever, to commercial fishermen. And the idea is that in real time, you get to see how far my actions intrude and wreck somebody else. And think about if we had a humanities game that talked about energy rights, fracking, whatever in the West. And this is an idea where you can take your computer scientists and your modeling and digital humanities and just traditional public humanities uh, conversations and you can have a rich thing and it's uh, experiential learning. That's what I love about it is it's not theoretical. I'm not saying read a 300 page book. I'm saying if you want to reintroduce a wolf or this or that, then let the rancher 
and the, and the person wants to do that and, and a third party come together and let's all see what our natural inclinations and self-interest, what it does to local economy or others. And, and that's the kind of things that humanities can do. So, so um, I love textbooks, I'm a book collector, but I think uh, we should look at it, ways of investing in the humanities as a real practical thing. So I'm, I'm sorry to make that an essay, um, but I don't have the answer. I, some of these declines are gonna continue. Um, but uh, we would do much better. I don't know as an English major if I needed uh, the 14th class in English. Maybe what I needed was a requirement to have an internship or to write copy for a newspaper, an ad agency, an online newspaper or, or, or something, um, applied humanities um, as a component of my education. Um, what I can say is those ideas are gonna come from the nonprofit sector and the universities and so we don't, my job isn't to dictate to you the vision. What it is is to have guidelines that are nimble enough so that you conceive of something and then we, we invest in those curriculum changes. And those grants are at two and three hundred thousand dollars. So it's a real number. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're getting a little short on time. So is, is there's one or two? Oh, yeah. Yes. You mentioned that you make a lot of decisions about how you allocate grant money. And you mentioned that when you decide, you're trying to decide what agencies or what organizations would get grant money if you do it based on things that would make a difference or remove the needle. Mm -hmm. So can you just elaborate on what you mean by those two? Yeah. yeah and Thank you. And, and so it's very nuanced, and we have seven divisions, and I won't go into all of them, but one of them is going to be a research, and it's going to be very esoteric, right? It, it, it really may be that this person has uh, the most insightful views of 12th century manuscripts, uh, you know, and, and wants to educate us about Coptic religion then. And, and they're going to write about that. And I'm not saying that changed the whole world or is applied in the examples I've just given. I still want to invest in that person. I want to invest in understanding world culture and languages and having on uh, that particular campus, you know, somebody who has a deep expertise. And so some areas like research are for that, and it is going to be esoteric. Some of them are going to be public programming in museums and what have you. So uh, as a practical matter, uh, we receive several thousand applications a year. We give out $120 million a year. That generates about, again, $5 in other economic activity. So over the course of a chairmanship, you should generally think of it as, I have half a billion dollars to spend in this sector. Catalytically, I don't want anything to be only federally funded because that means it wasn't institutional community buy-in. And that half billion dollars, again, will generate about $5. So what can we do with two and a half billion dollars in, in the humanities sector? And, and that's enough that you can start having an impact. Um, so it's a mix of public museum shows, curriculum changes, research, uh, um, the digital humanities, and of course 40% going to our state partners. So that is certainly going to mean that Colorado uh, Encyclopedia, uh, it might mean, uh, for example, here, and, and your professors here have been involved in this, is language revitalization. A generation ago we were talking about saving native elect American languages in terms of preserving them. We were talking about migrating old tapes to an online platform so people could hear them. And that was a way to, to take what was going to be extinct and present it in a more useful platform. We still do a little bit of that with the National Science Foundation. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and we've done that with Arapaho here. What I like, I, I love that. What I love even more is language revitalization projects. So we gave $2.1 million last year to, uh, with the support of the council members to the First, uh, First Nation Development Fund. And that is for 12 immersive language projects where you have an elder tell the, the stories and then you have a middle-aged family member or community member and then a, say, college age and a teen. And the idea that you're keeping these languages alive, the vocabulary, uh, alive, and so um, I'm sorry. That's a little close to your, your what you're talking about. Maybe not on the on the head of it, but um, some again, the public humanities and education are going to be very very practical, and then um, some are going to be the cutting edge of of research, 
And we've already, for example, uh, our intersection of chemistry and museum studies means that when you box up a piece, um, this is some kind of um, topping that's put here. It's off-gassing things the way it was glued down. And you put a case over it in a museum, it's going to off-gas in a way that if this isn't released for eight years and there was an object in there, it's going to affect it. And so we're doing a lot about looking at off-gassing. Um, the Smithsonian restored the Star Spangled Banner, and that's incredible. We paid for the graduate fellowships 20 years before to educate the curators who did it. And so we're investing in an unknown future. Um, and, and some of it's just, you know, we, uh, our founding legislation says, among other things, that democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. By the way, not in its government, which is implied, but in its citizens, the idea that we have some responsibility here. And uh, so I, I come back to these kind of large ideas about, uh, for me, I want to embed projects that will carry through 2026 and the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and, and to deal with issues such as cultural amnesia. Um, it, it, is, um, it is astonishing. Uh, the lack of, of kind of knowledge we're seeing. And, and you might feel in these moments that the left and the right aren't, aren't terribly united about, around much. I'm in Congress all the time where people of both parties are saying, we want people to know more about our nation. And the full, complete nation, the South, the West, uh, indigenous people. But, but that kind of erosion of knowledge is a, is a profound problem. So, quote Andre Gide. Uh, Okay, well, see, if somebody puts you on the spot, it doesn't organically get worked in. Um, organic. I know you're in Boulder, Colorado, so you keep using the word organic. I know it's well, up there. So. I, I also misuse the word by osmosis, too, you know. Um, when Patty was saying uh, the feelings of, of her and others that were appointed by President Obama, and, I, and, I, and the anxiety of not just political party, but the president's budget request, uh, and, and then finding ultimately that, uh, that uh, she, she understood what I was doing, not that we agree on every decision. Um, I, I came back to something that Andre Gide, you know, the, of course, the French writer, philosopher, novelist said. Um, he said, uh, don't understand me too quickly. And you know, I'm on social media all the time, but it's not a great one for that particular sentence. Don't understand me too quickly. Don't hear my accent, don't hear where I came from, don't look at my gender, don't, don't look at my political affiliations and, and presume that you know me. It's, you know, Whitman said it, right? I contain multitudes, you contain multitudes. Um, and so, so that's it, don't understand me too quickly. You know, in, in, in the South, in Mississippi, we don't ask what's your occupation. We said, who, where are you from? Who are your people? And, uh, and um, you know, my, uh, lastly, and, and bear with me for the, just a second. Um, so I've had the pleasure and the honor of serving uh, uh, these uh, uh, administrations. And, uh, uh, but I'm never going to do better and achieve more than when I taught night classes at a community college when I was between jobs, I'd have followed my wife. And then and, uh, I'm teaching comp classes in Mississippi at a community college. And then I started a little publishing house, and I get a job at a college, and I'm doing three jobs, and I'm only like a week ahead of the students. And I had forgotten how to diagram a sentence and, you know, and all this stuff. And I was making about two grand a class. And I'd do it for four months. And uh, first class, a woman comes to me. She's maybe older, middle age, And uh, she wants to be late to my class. And I'm a stickler. I really wasn't a friendly as a teacher. I don't think I was, you know, anxious and young. And, and, uh, and I said, well, why? Why, you know, beginning of our relationship, you're going to be late. And she need to be late every Tuesday or something like this because she cleans hotel rooms. And she's going to be late because sometimes it takes longer to clean a hotel room because somebody left it dirtier than you thought. And I said, yeah, you can be late. And she got her associate's degree that she could be a bank teller, that you, know, you needed some kind of ed education beyond high school was, was the idea. And that was going to transform her life and, and maybe her children's. And uh, the reason I don't sweat the controversy and everything else is I have a kind of a North Star here. And uh, it's her. And uh, 
I want her to come home from a long day of work, and I want to be able to turn on PBS and see Ken Burns and the other uh, films that we funded. And, uh, and those children, if they go to college, I want them to have an institution that has a humanities center, that she's educated by somebody who published a book under our research. And I want there to be a museum in their, in their community that had this, this, you know, the work we funded. And, uh, and in all candor, if we don't exist for her, if we don't serve her, then I don't get the point of endowment. I really don't. And so, um, so you know, in life you accumulate a lot of North Stars, but, but she kind of keeps me where I need to be um, sometimes. And, uh, and, and so th that's the idea. People talk about the implied humanities or digital humanities. It's just all humanities. It's, it's just all, you know, that kind of burning toward learning, you know. Thank you for visiting the University of Colorado and for speaking with us tonight. Thank you. Yeah.